If you have your Bibles, please turn them to Psalm 48. If you are first-time guests with us, we are in the middle of a seven-part sermon series through the book of Psalms. And we have looked at different psalms, and we've covered different themes through this book. And this morning we come to Psalm 48. And Elena, thank you for doing such a wonderful job of reciting that psalm this morning. What a joy it has been to have members of our church recite these psalms on these mornings. So Elena, thank you for serving us in that way. Before I preach, I do want to read this psalm just one more time. So read along with me, Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. Anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. Amen. May God bless the preaching of his word this morning. Have you ever known somebody who is really, really into just one thing? Like there's, there's one thing in life that really makes this person happy. Well, if you were ever to visit my parents' house, you would quickly discover that one of them really, really loves lighthouses. And that person is my mother. And on every corner of the house, every wall, every shelf, it is filled with lighthouse decorations. And she actually, she does a wonderful job decorating. It's not tacky lighthouses. The house looks fantastic, but it is definitely an obsession. There is an abundance of evidence that my mom really loves lighthouses. This is great because if you want to make my mom happy, you buy her a lighthouse gift. Or if I'm driving around and and I see a lighthouse, which doesn't happen often in Delaware, but other places, if I see a lighthouse, I will will pull over, I'll get as close as I can, take a picture and send it to my mom and that will make her happy because she is about lighthouses and if you are about lighthouses, that is gonna make her happy. And as we read Psalm 48, we quickly see that there is something that God himself really, really loves and is all about, and that is his people. This psalm is a declaration of God's great love for his people. It speaks of the great lengths that God will go to care for us. God is all about working for the good of his people, and this psalm is written because God really wants us to know that. He wants you to have great confidence this morning. He wants you to know the value of what is happening even this morning as we are gathered together as his treasured people. And he wants the joy of our church to be found in him alone. And this psalm is filled with reasons for us to do so. Here's the the main idea of my message this morning, is that God delights in being the strength of his people. God delights in being the strength of his people. And I have three points for us. First, the city of Zion. Second, the victory of God. And then third, the joy of the church. Point one, the city of Zion. This psalm begins with a description of a magnificent city. There is lots of imagery in this psalm of mountains and citadels, but the the focal point of these verses is Mount Zion. 
the city of God, beautiful in elevation and design. And, and as you read these verses, you see that Mount Zion is of great importance. And the most important thing about this city is not where it is located or how it is constructed. The most important thing about this city is who is its king. We see this in the first three verses. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. So these opening verses are all about meaning to stir up an excitement in your hearts about this city. So as I begin here, I, I want to first answer the question, what is the city of Zion? And Nathan actually spoke about this a little bit in his message last week and how in the Old Testament, the, the city of Zion or, or Mount Zion in our passage this morning was another name for the city of Jerusalem, the, the capital city of the nation of Israel. We see this in Isaiah 40, verse 9, where it says, Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem. So, so Zion was symbolic for the center of the nation of Israel. This is where the temple was built. This is where God dwelt with his people, communed with his people. But also, Zion was, was sometimes used to speak to the entire nation of Israel. We see this later in Isaiah 60. They shall call you, speaking to Israel, the people of God, they shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. And in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. For I have bent Judah as my bow. I have made Ephraim its arrow. I will stir up your sons, O Zion. And so in these verses, Zion is not just a literal city, but it refers figuratively to all of God's people in the Old Testament, all of his chosen people. And then in the New Testament, Zion refers often to the church, which is us. We see this in 1 Peter 2. We're speaking to the church. It says, you yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a, whole, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So in these verses, Zion refers to all believers, the church, with Jesus Christ as our center. And later in Hebrews 12 and Revelation 21, Zion is spoken of as a place where the, the presence and the power of God are made known and experienced by God's people. Okay, so that's a, a three-minute biblical theology on Mount Zion. It's, it's symbolic for the people of God, but more specifically, it's symbolic for the power and the presence of God with his people. In Psalm 48 makes it clear that the reason for Zion's beauty is not because it is made up of God's people. The reason for, that, for Zion's beauty is that God abides with his people. And is that not true of the church today? Consider even this morning, this, this gathering of believers, this, this small representation of the whole people of God throughout the world, this is a beautiful thing in God's eyes. God loves you, church. There's nothing on this earth that is more precious to him than the church. The, the worship taking place here, the serving that is happening down in Redeemer Kids, the, the fellowship that we will have with each other after the service, this is a wonderful thing, a beautiful thing. But the reason for the beauty of the church is not because of who you are, but because of who is with us. Notice how Psalm 48 does not speak of Zion as being a great city. It speaks of Zion as being the city of the great king. The, the blessings that we experience as a church, the, the beauty of this fellowship, it is not because we are impressive. It is because God is with us. H have you ever been somewhere where the experience 
was so wonderful, not necessarily because of where you were, but because of who you were with. Like I've, I've been to a restaurant before with just a great group of friends and the experience seemed so wonderful, the, the food tasted so great, but then I went back to that same restaurant later with maybe a different group of people and the food didn't quite taste as good. Or, or maybe you've, you've seen a movie and you just saw it with just the right person and just you laughed and laughed, you thought this is just the best movie I've ever seen and maybe later you watch that movie again maybe by yourself, and you think, why did I like this movie? This movie is awful. And that's because it is who you were with in those moments that mattered so much. And this is how it is with the church. We are not impressive, but our God is with us, and he is impressive, church. He is our joy. He is our strength. He has chosen the church to be the people that he has revealed his glory to and to bless and to show favor to and to work through for the good of the world. And that ought to transform the way that we think about the church. On Sunday mornings, when you are driving to church, are you thinking to yourself, I have the privilege of gathering together with the people of God whom he loves more than anything else in this world. I get to worship with the great king this morning. Do you come with a heart to serve those around you knowing that you are a part of the community that God calls the joy of all the earth? We should love the church because God loves the church. There is nothing on this earth that he loves more. God loves you, Redeemer Fellowship. He is present with us this morning. He is active in our lives to show us favor, to protect us, and to help you. And and he, he does this individually in our lives, but there is a particular way in which God's favor and love is shown toward the gathered community of believers, that is, the church. Psalm 43, 8 says, Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. Within her citadels, God is the fortress of the church. And as this psalm continues, it does so by recounting a story. A story of a mighty victory that God won for his people. And this leads us to our second point this morning, the victory of God. Verses 4 4 through 7 tell us a story of a battle that the enemy of God's people waged against Israel. Multiple kings of other nations apparently had had allied together. They had assembled these many ships of war to defeat God's people. But that battle did not go as Israel's enemies expected. Psalm 48 says that when the kings saw the city of Zion and they witnessed the power of God to protect his people, it says that they fled in terror, that their vessels were all destroyed. We see this in verses 4 through 7. For behold, the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, meaning Zion, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there. Anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind, you shattered the ships of Tarshish. Now, historians don't know exactly what battle this verses are speaking of, and it could be that these verses are speaking not just of one battle, but of of many victories that God gave to his people over their enemies, because Israel had many enemies over the years. The Old Testament is filled with stories of Israel so often under siege from other enemies around them. The the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Philistines, they they were constantly under attack from those around them, And they were regularly forced to rely upon God for help and for protection. And God came to their rescue. And again, we we don't know which specific attack this psalm is referring to. But what is clear is that the battle belongs to God. Notice how in verse 7 it says, By the east wind you, God, shattered the ships of Tarshish which, side note, is a hard phrase to say quickly. Shattered the ships of Tarshish is a tongue twister. Um, but there is, there is lots of battle imagery here. But the picture that we see 
is of God bringing help to his people and establishing them in a place of security. The kings of the nations descended on Israel, but the power and protection of God caused those kings to flee in panic. The great weapons of these enemies, these ships of Tarshish, were shattered by the storm that God brought on them. There is war against God's people But verse 8 says that God establishes them forever. The point here is that God's people were secure because God fought for them. And this, this wartime language in the Old Testament is not one that ceases to be used when the New Testament speaks of how God continues to come to our defense today. He is the fortress of the church And he's the fortress of your own life as well. And this is particularly true when we give ourselves to following Jesus and by investing into his church and by doing the work of gospel ministry. Matthew 16, 18 says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That is wartime language. We are at war, church. The the gates of hell are against us. Satan would love to put an end to the work of gospel ministry here at our church. He would love to see disunity spread among our fellowship. He would would love for there to be hidden sins in your lives that remain hidden, remain unconfessed, and that grow and that bring ruin to your marriages. He would love to see the upcoming election stir up division among our fellowship. He would love for your pastors to give in to the the pressure of the culture and and water down the message of the gospel and God's word in our teaching. He would love to see each one of you grow cold in your love for his word and for prayer and to grow in bitterness and anxiety. All of these things and many more are dangers to the church. They are very real enemies that we face today. And apart from God's help, these enemies would overrun us and destroy us. And to think otherwise is is foolishness because we are a fragile people. We break easily, don't we? We give in to sin. We, We are quickly divided. Bitterness can fester. Gossip can spread. We keep sins hidden. We waver in our faith. We lose heart We forget what God has done. And and we see the waves rising. We see enemy ships on the horizon. And we start to to see our own weakness. And and, and we start to think that maybe this time God is going to leave us. And we will be overrun. And God knows that we are quick to think these things. He knows that we need reminders that he indeed is for us. And that is why Psalm 48 was written. It it was a reminder to Israel of this great victory that God had won for them. What the psalmist is doing here is he's saying, look what God has done. See how he has defeated your enemies. The ships of Tarshish are nothing. All the enemies of God's people must flee at the sight of God's power. And don't we need reminders of this this morning as well? We need reason to have courage in this life. And as helpful as it is to know this story in Psalm 48, isn't it true that for those of us who know Christ, we know of a much greater victory? Whatever historical event Psalm 48 is speaking about, it pales in comparison to the great victory that Christ has won for his church on the cross. Church, church, it's it's good to look back over the years and reflect on the many ways that God has provided for us. It's right to rejoice in the ways that God has helped us to overcome sin. It is right to rejoice in the ways that God has gifted you to serve and to strengthen the church. We should remember these things. We should rejoice in these things. But our greatest confidence must be in the gospel. In remembering what Jesus has done on the cross. Because it is on the cross that Christ has defeated our greatest enemy. He has shattered 
the ships of Tarshish that were our sin and our guilt that separated us from God. And he has made us his people. And he has established himself forever as our great fortress so that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Church, we are secure against the spiritual enemies that would destroy us. And we are not secure because somehow we are more impressive than other churches or because somehow your faith is greater than those around you. No, we are secure because Jesus Christ has paid your debt on the cross. He has defeated sin and death and Satan and he has risen from the grave. He has ascended into heaven. He sits on his throne this morning reigning over all things and is the great fortress of the church. Amen? Amen. And if you are here this morning and you are feeling attacked on all sides, you're finding that, that sin seems to be getting the upper hand again, you see what's happening around the world and, and you wonder, is God still for us? Look to the cross. See the great love that Jesus has for you. And know that these words are true, spoken in another Psalm, Psalm 46, just two chapters back. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way. Do you feel the earth is giving way at times? Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the mornings dawn. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Redeemer Fellowship, take hope in that truth this morning. Rejoice in this truth. This is what God's people do. And this is what we see God's people doing as Psalm 48 continues, which leads us to our third point, the joy of the church. In verse 9, God's people consider the great love that God had for them. They consider his great power and strength, and they rejoice. We see this in these verses. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. As your name, O God, so your praise reaches the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. And then this, let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Psalm 48 is a call to worship, which of course is how this psalm began in verse 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. He is your mighty fortress. He loves you. He has given Christ to you. He has established the church forever and he is your great king and his greatness demands a response. And the response that he wants is your gladness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Church, I, I love what this psalm reveals about God's heart for us. He works for our good he stands in our defense, he has worked out our salvation, and he has done so for your joy. Don't you love this about God? That he wants this for his church. He not only wants it, but he calls us to it. This psalm is a call to gladness. It, and, and it joins a host of other passages throughout the Bible that command us to be glad to rejoice in the good work that God has done on our behalf. But church, we know that the call to be glad is a hard call to obey, which seems strange. Of all of God's commands, the command to be glad should be the easy one, should be the one that we would want to obey. But, but it's, we know it's hard. 
So often that the, the joy that God calls us to feels so far away. Our, our confidence in God is fleeting. Gladness is hard to hold on to. It, it seems to slip so easily through our fingers. The call to obey, the call to be glad is a hard one. Churches, which is why we need one another. Notice with me what God's people do in this psalm. In verse 9, it says that they gathered together in the temple and they considered together the steadfast love of God. They come together and they remember all that God has done for them. And church, I think that there's something that is really important for us in this psalm right here. This, this call to be glad is a community project. Just as Psalm 48 reminded Israel of the great victory of God, so do we need to remind one another of the ways that God continues to work for good in our lives. This is why God calls us to be a church. One of the main ways that God sustains our gladness is through our togetherness. Because it is within the people of God that God dwells. It is through the fellowship of believers that God works to strengthen his church. This is why church is so important. And, and by that, I do not mean this building. This building is not the church. You are the church. This fellowship that exists even here this morning, this is the church. And Christ is so committed to his church that he was willing to give his own life for us. And if Christ is so committed to his church, ought we not be so committed to his church? Amen. And if I could just take a moment here to encourage you as the members of Redeemer Fellowship. We have a wonderful gift in the fellowship that is here. Treasure that gift. If you are a part of this church, have ambition to really be a part of this church. Hebrews 10 a passage we mentioned a few weeks ago says, do not let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Prioritize Sunday morning gatherings. Be together in fellowship group. Fellowship together throughout the week where there are opportunities to serve in the church. Be the first to sign up and to serve. Labor, work hard for the good of the church. Not because the church is perfect, but because the church needs your help. And God is passionate about healthy churches. And when you are here, when you're in that fellowship, let your concern not just be that you yourself be strengthened, but let your heart be to encourage and pursue the growth of those around you. Use your gifts to care for others. Be generous to support the work of ministry. Invest in relationships here. Labor and pray for others. Be someone who regularly prays for your brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. Be someone who fights for unity in the church. Because the fellowship of the church, which God loves so much, is a fragile thing. Let us protect that unity of the church. Do not be someone who spreads gossip about others in the church. Be quick to forgive one another and show grace towards one another. The church is a beautiful place, but as we know, it is filled with sinners. And Christ has been so merciful to us. And if Christ has been so merciful, we need to be merciful to one another. If there's someone here in the church that you are at odds with, then get help and work hard to be reconciled to that person. Encourage one another. Do, do you see God at work in the lives of those around you? Tell them about that. When is the last time that you meaningfully encouraged another person here in the church? Do, do you find yourself as someone who mostly brings critiques or are you someone who is quick to see and point out evidences of grace in the lives of others 
Use your words to uplift one another, to strengthen Christ's church. This is what it means to give ourselves to the church. And we do this, we, we pour our lives out for the church because Christ has poured his life out for the church. And his glory is seen through the church. Contend for the glory of Christ by contending for the good of his church. Would those around you who know you well speak of you as someone who has a passion for the church? A passion that is fueled by the understanding that God loves his church and he works in mighty ways through the church for the good of the world. And, and, and a passion for these things is exactly where Psalm 48 concludes. Where in verses 12 through 14 it says, Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, Consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever. Again, this is a, a call to consider all the ways that God has been good to his people. Walk about Zion, consider the beauty of Christ's church, number her towers, recall the many ways that God has been faithful to you. Go through her citadels. Rejoice that God is your strength and your salvation. And these final verses, we are given one last reason that God calls us to share in his passion for the church. And the reason is this, that you may tell the next generation that this is God. Church, our response to God's goodness ought not just be a rejoicing but also a proclaiming. The reason the church exists is to be a demonstration to all the earth that God is the great king and the one in whom we find our joy above anything else. Remember verse two, where the psalm speaks of Zion as being beautiful in elevation and the joy of all the earth? What a verse that is. Zion, the people of God, the joy of all the earth? What a thing to be said about the church. Redeemer Fellowship, do you know that that is how God thinks of you? It is his church that he has purposed to be the joy of all the earth. And of course, we know that this does not mean that the church itself is impressive. Because we are not. Take a look around you. We are not that impressive, church. And certainly... The whole world does not find its joy in the church, right? Millions of people want nothing to do with the church or the gospel that we treasure so much. And even this own psalm speaks of the many enemies of the church. So how is it then that the church is the joy of all the earth? Well, the answer, of course, is not that, the, that, it's not that it is in the church that we find our joy and our satisfaction. No, it is only Christ who truly satisfies but how does the world come to know Christ? It is through the work of God's people. It is through the power of the gospel at work in the church. We exist to tell the next generation who our God is. And not just the next generation, but all those who do not yet place their faith in Christ. This is the work that God has done through his people over all of these years. I like to think of the church and the, the history of the church, of which we are a part, as, as an ongoing relay race, where for a short period of time we are handed the baton of the gospel. And our task is to run well and to treasure that gospel, but then to pass it on to others that they might run with it as well. Are we passing on the baton of the gospel to the next generation? One day, we're going to cross the finish line. But until that day, it is the baton that matters. Are you passing it on? Are you passing on the message of the gospel to your children, to your neighbor, to the nations, and to the next generation for the joy of all the earth? This is why we exist. This is why we invest into the church, that we might rejoice together in what God has done, that we might spread the gospel, that we might hold on together to Christ, who is our fortress and our great king, and one day he's coming back. 
the final chapters of the Bible and the book of Revelation speak one last time to the city of Zion. It doesn't mention it by name, but it's the same city that our psalm speaks of, except this city is an eternal city where all of God's people will dwell with Christ in heaven for all of time. Revelation 21, and I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. The hope of Psalm 48 is a real hope. God is with us. He delights in you, church. He is the strength of his people. He is our salvation. And a day is coming when the fullness of that hope will be realized. Redeemer Fellowship, stand firm until that day. Encourage one another. Be committed to one another. Rejoice in what Christ has done for you and tell all of what God has done. Because great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. Join me in prayer.